From WRAL News, this is Focal Point. Man-made global warming. Is the debate over? No, I'm not a believer. It's, uh, it's a big hoax. Some say global warming is just hot air. Global warming is nothing but a bunch of junk science that's been thrown together by politicians and militant activists. Skeptics remain. Well, I used to be one of those people. <laughs> so did our state's climatologist. I didn't quite see the preponderance of evidence um, that, that's available now. Evidence gathered by scientists from all over the world. Is there any reason to doubt that global warming is occurring? No. No, I have no, no doubts about it. And many scientists have no doubt that we're at least partly to blame. You burn 400 million years of petroleum in 100 years, you will change the chemistry of the atmosphere, period. And maybe melt the polar ice. So we're gonna at least double sea level rise in the next century over what we've experienced in the past century. Is it hot in here or is it just me? Skeptics may remain, but our state government is taking the issue seriously. What we can do is prepare for the impacts in North Carolina and try to understand them. Some of our state's largest corporations are preparing too. In fact, this may be the most important challenge our company will be facing in the next 20 years. Is it time for North Carolina to move beyond the debate and plan for the future? I think the time for debating whether or not it's happening uh, is over. When it comes to global warming, skepticism seems to be giving way to realism. Here in North Carolina, people whose lives and livelihoods may be affected are taking the issue seriously. So are many of our state's leaders, including those in both government and business. Our focal point, the hot topic of global warming, rising sea level, and what it all means for North Carolina. A Russian icebreaker plows through a sheet of Arctic ice. Climate scientists from around the world are on board. They all agree that climate change is happening. They have seen it in their years of research. Mike Dunn caught a glimpse of it too. He's an educator from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Dunn was on board the ship documenting the scientists' work. To stand up there and look out over an endless horizon of sea ice and realize that perhaps what we humans are doing is changing that at an incredibly fast rate was very humbling. Scientists say the sea ice supports the Arctic ecosystem and helps regulate global climate. In summer, it's roughly the size of the United States. But these satellite images show how it has shrunk 25% since 1981. Some climate models suggest that within 50 years, the summer sea ice will not exist. So something the size of the United States will not exist in the summer anymore. The National Climatic Data Center in Asheville houses the world's largest archive of climate data. More than a century of climate measurements are stored here. This is one of a series of about 114 stations that we're installing all around the, uh, the continental United States. NCDC scientists record the climate with ground monitors, radar, and satellite. Ice cores and tree rings provide the record before that technology existed. And what it tells us, at least over the past 2,000 years, is the warming of the past 35 to 40 years is exceeding the range of natural variability. And that's one of the major reasons why we uh, think that, uh, that the climate is changing due to increases in carbon dioxide and methane. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change used data from the NCDC in Asheville in a recent report that blames the Earth's accelerated warming on man. Duke University's Gabrielle Hegel is one of hundreds of international scientists on the IPCC. We see that the surface of the Earth has warmed, the lower atmosphere has warmed, the oceans have warmed, the glaciers are melting. It's very difficult to come up with any other explanation for what is happening, and we have studied carefully all possible other explanations. Hegel and other IPCC scientists say average global temperature has fluctuated over the last thousand years, but has steadily risen over the last 100. I think the findings have made it very clear that there is very strong evidence that this greenhouse warming is happening. So in, in my view, that debate is relatively closed. 
in the very near future, as sea level continues to rise. Stan Riggs is a coastal geologist at East Carolina University. He's been studying coastal erosion for decades. Oh, absolutely. Riggs says Earth has been warming on its own since the end of the last ice age, 20,000 years ago. But he says man has been hitting the gas for the last century. We are exaggerating the processes. And no question about it. You don't have six and a half billion people on the surface of the Earth burning fossil fuels that rapidly and not change the atmosphere. At the U.S. Geological Survey in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, scientists are studying how warming is raising sea level and how that could affect North Carolina's coast. The data suggests that, that sea level is starting to accelerate in the rise uh, over the past uh, maybe 50 years. On the east coast, it rose about a foot over the last century. Scientific models project about another two-foot rise over the next. That's going to be an important issue for North Carolina because so much of the coastal plain is, is, uh, is at uh, sea level or just a couple of feet above sea level. When you think about rising sea level on our coast, melting ice in the Arctic doesn't seem so far away. I think people can quibble whether it's human caused or not, but uh, one of the scientists on board said we better get used to the fact that change will happen and we need to plan for it. Next, what changes may be in store for North Carolina? Greenville will be on the water. It'll be equivalent to where Little Washington is today on the Pamlico River estuary. You're watching Focal Point. What do global warming and rising sea level mean to our state? It could mean a North Carolina that's very different than the one we know today. And if not for us, then for our children and our grandchildren. The people of Swan Quarter are building a dike nearly 10 miles around their community. I guess we're just getting prepared. Prepared for more salt water. Got that dirt underneath my fingernails and hate to get rid of it. It's Swan Quarter dirt. Guire Cahoon has farmed it most of his life. It seems like in the later years that I've been living here that the tide water has really uh, risen some and uh, the tide stays a little higher than it used to. Salt water on, on farmland uh, destroys the land. Cahoon says more salt water seems to come in with every storm. It was just like a giant wave coming in the street here, uh, rolling up the street. Hurricane Isabel was the worst. We really didn't realize that uh, storm surges could be as bad as they were until Isabel came, came in here. Scientists say global warming could fuel more storms like Isabel. And they say more storms and rising sea level could put major sections of the Outer Banks underwater within a few decades. Some portion of those Outer Banks are going to collapse. They're going to be gone. Inland coastal areas along sounds and rivers are vulnerable too. We have 4,000 miles of estuarine shoreline. It's all eroding, all of it. Some of it up to as much as 100 feet in a, in a single storm. Dozens of new waterfront communities are being built along the shoreline. We're going to get storm surges in there that are 10-foot, 15-foot storm surges up in those estuaries. And all of a sudden, you've got all these people down there. It's wipeout. Farmland could be wiped out, too, as salt water migrates inland. All across our state, rising carbon dioxide levels and temperatures could change our agricultural landscape. Varieties of corn and wheat that grow well now here in central North Carolina may not do so in the future. So it's really going to disrupt agriculture, in my mind, in a, in a very, very significant way. An increase in carbon dioxide does boost the growth of some vegetable crops and greenhouses. But there's a limit to that. Once CO2 levels rise too much, then there's a negative impact on plant performance. Many scientists say that in 50 years, atmospheric carbon dioxide will be double what it was just prior to the start of the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. 
Scientists have created that level of carbon dioxide in these pine stands in Duke Forest to see how much of it the trees remove from the atmosphere. If the forests do take more CO2 from the atmosphere as the concentration is increasing, it will slow down the rate at which CO2 is building up in the atmosphere. The trees are taking more CO2 out of the air, but so far much of it is being released back into the atmosphere from decaying material the trees are leaving on the forest floor. If CO2 levels continue to rise at the rate that they're doing, uh, we are in for some very, very serious issues in regards to the biosphere. Pests and disease may thrive in an environment warmed by increased CO2. We've seen definitely warmer winters over the last four years. Max Lloyd owns a vineyard along the Hall River. He depends on cold winters to protect French grapes from disease. One of the reasons we chose this site at above 700 feet of elevation was at the time we bought this farm, we thought that would protect us from Pierce's disease. The disease can wipe out his grapes. Lloyd says it didn't get cold enough last winter to kill the bacteria that spreads it. January and March were unusually warm. And the plants sort of lost their mind and they budded six to eight days depending on the species early. A late frost killed the new buds. This is a big deal and these warm winters that are confusing the plants are gonna be a big deal for, for the grape industry. Global warming could be a big deal for North Carolina's Christmas tree industry too. Dale Hawkins grows the popular Fraser firs. About all I know. He knows something's changing too. Extreme dry and then with extreme moisture. Uh, and we're not seeing really as cold of winters as we have seen in the years past. Uh, seems like winters are warmer. We run three aerial lifts and we have three uh, conveyor lifts. Chris Bates, general manager of the Catalucci Ski Area in Maggie Valley, says he's also noticing changes. It does seem like it is getting warmer. Uh, this winter was a lot of extremes. Very warm or very cold. Scientists say climate change will bring more extremes. There's going to be drastic changes in precipitation. Some areas are going to be wetter, some areas are going to be drier. Meaning more droughts and more floods. It's been said many times that climate is the average of extremes. We just may be seeing a climate that's an average of, of more extreme extremes. This is our drainage for our, our farmland. Extremes are never good for farmers like Guire Cahoon, but they won't matter much if the rising sea inundates his land around Swan Quarter. They keep talking that uh, we're going to be the next nags head, <laughs> but uh, I don't know, probably not in my lifetime. Maybe climate change won't affect our lives, but is there anything we can do to keep it from affecting our children and grandchildren? We will not be able to prevent it entirely, but we will make it a, a lot smaller problem. You're watching Focal Point. If the planet is getting warmer and the sea is rising, then what can we do about it? And how can we prepare? Well, you might be surprised to learn what some people in North Carolina are already doing. Bob and Linda Rodriguez's silver car and white house are both green. Their car is a hybrid and their house is energy efficient. About 75 to 85 percent of the energy that we would normally use electricity wise to heat, the sun's doing it for free. It's heating a water tank down below their house in a well insulated crawl space. It doesn't get real hot, doesn't get real cold. Coming on up. Same for the attic, which is insulated with a radiant barrier. So if it's in the 90s, it'll be the 90s, rather than this uh, cooker of 120, 130 degrees. The Rodriguez's have sealed up space around vents, switched to energy efficient appliances, and compact fluorescent light bulbs. They say they've cut their utility bill 25%. They say small differences can add up to big change. It's important at the state level, federal level, but it's also important for citizens to take action. At the local level, several North Carolina cities have signed on to an initiative to reduce greenhouse gases. We have an opportunity to set guidelines in how we design our cities, uh, how cities are laid out. And I just think we, we're the perfect organization to be able to try to take the lead in an effort such as this. 
At the state level, our legislature has created a commission on global climate change. Jeff Williams of the U.S. Geologic Survey was one of the first to testify before the commission. He told the panel that rising sea level is one of the most pressing issues facing our state. But I think the good news is that of all the states uh, in the United States, I think North Carolina is really in a leadership front in addressing climate change. So many as favor passage will vote aye. The state legislature may have little impact on global climate change. What we can do is prepare for the impacts in North Carolina and try to understand them. So far, the commission's recommendations focus on cutting the state's contribution to the problem through energy efficiencies, but not the tougher questions about how to deal with the impact of the problem itself particularly the impact of rising sea level on coastal communities. Some areas are just going to be below sea level eventually and, and uh, we're going to have to move away from the coast. Move away, not just from the barrier islands, but perhaps from the inland coastal areas too. We have 4,000 miles of estuarine shoreline in North Carolina. Are we going to dike all 4,000 miles? The challenge is how do we design a development so that we can handle the storm surge, so we can handle the shoreline erosion, so we can handle the migration of the system for 25, 50 years down the road. The sea level is rising, sea level is likely to accelerate into the future, uh, and we need to get on with having the debate and, and putting policies in place to, to deal with the new reality of what North Carolina is going to look like in 2100. Some aren't waiting for political decisions. Five major North Carolina-based companies have been nationally recognized for developing strategies to deal with global warming. Progress Energy made the move after seeing the science. And uh, we were convinced at that time that this is something that's obviously real, growing, and something we needed to address. The company plans to meet new demand by helping its customers use energy more efficiently. It's also investing in cleaner power generation and alternative energy sources. Others are taking steps too. Catalucci Ski Area has installed new snowmaking equipment. I think most of our um, push so far has been to put in equipment that allows us to make snow at a little bit higher temperature and a lot more efficiently when that temperature presents itself. Max Lloyd is testing grapes that thrive in warmer weather. You know, now with global warming, maybe we should be looking more at what they're growing in Spain or, or Italy or some of the warmer places in Europe. <laughs> Dale Hawkins is testing new varieties of trees. The Frasers will not exist if we exceed some of those 90 degree temperatures for extended periods of time. We've just basically tracked our old uh, utility bills. And the Rodriguez's want to expand their use of alternative energy. I think a lot of people feel like they can't do anything or make a difference. I believe that we can. Next, what happens to the global warming debate when longtime skeptics change their view? Even the skeptics are, are admitting that there's climate change, so the, the real issue is what, what are going to be the impacts and how much is it going to change? You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News, in-depth coverage you can count on. To learn more about the issues covered in this episode of Focal Point, visit WRAL.com and click on News, then Documentaries. There is never complete unanimity in science or public opinion. Someone will always question a finding or a policy. But when it comes to global warming and rising sea level, at what point do we as a society decide to do something to plan or prepare, even if calamity is not a certainty. News Talk 680 WPTF. It's something that the Democrats and the ultra militant liberals are trying to shove down the throat of the American people, and I pray to God it don't work. On conservative talk radio, you'll hear plenty of skepticism about global warming. It's a heated, passionate debate. What we don't have on there is a maximum gust for the hour yet. Even our state's climatologist had doubts. I didn't quite see the preponderance of evidence. Um, that, that's available now. Well, here's weather scope showing those isolated showers. Neither did WREL meteorologist Greg Fischel. He was a skeptic, but kept an open mind. I didn't want to be one of those people that was saying, okay, I've committed myself to this way of thinking. I'm going to go out and find things and only find things to support my opinion because that's not science. Science is always having an open mind, always looking at the latest data 
and then trying to be as objective as you can in evaluating that data. And the dew point was 68 at 18 Z. Science is objective and science is observation and it was Fischl's look at images of vanishing polar ice that helped make him a believer. It's not so much that that's never happened before, it's the rate at which it's happening. And it correlates very, very well with the amount of CO2 that we're putting into the air. It was ice core samples showing that surge in atmospheric CO2 that helped convince our state climatologist. That in and of itself is an incredibly powerful piece of evidence. Um, that, that did a lot to sway me and, and uh, I think for a lot of other scientists too. Many others are finally being swayed too. I think we have to accept the view that uh, scientists have that there is global warming and that human uh, operation, human condition contributes to that. We simply must do everything that we can in our power to slow down global warming. Even the Bush administration has acknowledged global warming and man's contribution to it. The president himself is publicly pushing alternative energy. And these technologies will help us be better stewards of the environment. And they will help us to confront the serious challenge of global climate change. But will the walk follow the talk? It's tough for policymakers to sometimes look out 50 and 100 years to make policy that will have impacts then. They're worried very much on what's going to happen next week, what's going to happen in the next election cycle. I think the time for debating whether or not it's happening uh, is over. I mean, do we have all the answers about what is going to happen? No, we don't. But, but with science, you, you never have the absolute last word. But I don't think we need the last word to, to take some actions.